Ah, you did it. We're recording. Yay. Okay. Let's go All ahead, right. there, shall we? Father, thank you for this morning, the opportunity again to be joined together, to open your word, to study together. Thank you for uh, Lord Exodus that we have been studying now for uh, months. And uh, Lord, uh, there's still more to, that we can discuss today that will be useful for our lives. We just ask that you would be in the center of our time. We thank you for uh, Zoom. And we thank you for all those who have joined the call. We ask that, uh, Lord, we would just be um, uh, able to um, be encouraged in your words we study together today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Israel is in the first year since leaving Egypt. And if, uh, just as a reminder, on page 25 of our Sunday school book, there is a nice chart that gives an overview of the entire book. But in a short time, much has happened, clearly demonstrating God's grace, mercy, and loving kindness. For recall, God hears his, the cry of his people under bondage way at the beginning. He called Moses. He plagued Egypt, and Israel re was released after 430 years, fulfilling Genesis 15 through 15. The people before entering the desert had seen the majesty and the power of God through the plagues, but most clearly, the miracle of the Red Sea parting. They saw that up front and personal. Israel went out into the desert, two to three million people strong, plus significant flocks. The people and the livestock could not survive without water. God provided. The people and the livestock could not survive without food. But God specifically provided and continued until they entered the promised land. God provided shade by day and light by night, always reminding the people of his presence. God provide for, provided for their defense when attacked by the Amalekites. God brought them to Mount Sinai and demonstrated his presence more clearly by fire, earthquakes, and cloud. People feared God. They cried out to Moses to intercede for them. And the presence of the holy God overwhelmed them. God provided his law in chapters 20 to 23. In chapter 24, the people ratified that, that law with a covenant. All that God says we will do. Does that sound like any of our lives when we're presented with something like that? In our own strength, we have every determination, but unfortunately, they were not successful. God anointed Aaron and his sons to be priests and provided the description of their garments and the tabernacle that they would minister, where they would minister before him. And his grace and mercy were constantly known. But then in chapter 32, as Dan covered last week, despite God's constant blessings, man, even with his good intentions, could not live in obedience to God. Romans 3.23 reminds us that all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The people fall and they produce the gold calf idol. The people sin despite God's presence before them over the mountain where Moses had gone. God judges through the Levites with 3,000 dying and other people plagued, probably resulting in many more deaths. And Moses goes before God as their mediator, offering his own name's removal from God's book, if necessary. But God says each man will be responsible for his own sin. But God will not abandon his covenant with Abraham. So we come this week to chapters 33 and 34, which is lesson 15 of our fall study. In these, in these weeks, um, these, in, in these two chapters, we see the lowest point, three chapters actually, we see the lowest point in chapter 32 and the highest point in the whole book, idolatry to God's glory. So the outline I'm going to try to follow today, and I'm not going to be able to read all this because there's an awful lot here. But uh, I tried to break this up into some uh, reasonable bites, and, um, and we'll just kind of take a look at that. 
uh, as we go through these two chapters today. So in these first 11 verses, Moses is commanded to leave, but also commune. Uh, and let's, I'm not going to read this, but um, coming out of chapter 2, in his holiness, God has every right to judge the people with a great judgment for their sin. And in fact, in 33.5, he says, um, you are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. He has every ability and every right to do that. Having spent months at Sinai, God now commands Moses, though, to depart and bring the people up to the land of the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as we see in verse 2. And God would remove the pagan people before them. In this, God is displaying his one of his wonderful attributes in that that we find in these two chapters. He is holy, he is righteous, but he and just, but he is also gracious and faithful to his word. Though they sinned, God will be faithful to his covenant, his unconditional covenant to Abraham. God in his grace and mercy, despite their rebellion and their sin, still commands Moses to depart and go to the land, and he will even send his angel. In verse 2, I will send my angel before you uh, to drive out the residents of the land. But, verse 3, I will not go in your midst. This had to be just really a, a time of soul searching and and. He, the people have to see the gravity of their sin and what they have done. He will not go in mercy lest he consume them along the way, he says. God has spent hundreds of years building the nation. The consequences of their sin now hit the people, and they mourn. In verse 4, when the people heard these grave tidings, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. They removed their jewelry, removed their ornaments. In doing this, I think there was a certain abandoning of the worldly attachment, the Egyptian attachment, which had led them to their great sin of idolatry. The people are not holy. They know they are not holy. And they know they are only not consumed by God justly because of his mercy. In verses 7 to 11, we see Moses setting up this tabernacle of meeting outside the camp, away from the sinful people. Calvin says this is a sign of the divorce between God and the Israelites. In verse 7, it was, as, it was far from the camp. You know, it wasn't convenient. It was distant from the camp. And it wasn't Moses' own dwelling place because God would never come to his own place and make it sacred by his presence. So this was, it says uh, he took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, but that wasn't his personal tent. That was a tent that he used for this tabernacle of meeting. So this tent of meeting was a constant reminder to the people of their sin, which was outside the camp and the need for repentance before a holy God. To seek the Lord, they must separate themselves from the camp in coming before the Lord in prayer or seeking counsel for their own life. We saw back in, I think it was chapter 17, how Moses was trying to judge all the people for the issues that came up in their lives just day in and day out. And, you know, there was an ongoing need for people to have counsel. Um, but there was just like, there, there was a, a, like a gap or like a blockage now maybe that um, made it more difficult. And maybe a reminder that the grace of God 
was important that they needed to seek. Only the man Moses would come before God and actually enter the tent. And as Moses sought the Lord, God visibly confirmed his presence by the pillar of cloud coming down over the tent. The people were aware when Moses sought the Lord and rose up to worship God at that point. Remember in chapter 32 last week, 32 verse 6, it said, They rose up early the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Rose up to play. But now they properly rise up to worship God. They worship God when Moses goes out to that tent. I was thinking, I remember, this is several, a couple months ago, but Kristen made this point back in chapter 12, um, in verse 38, it said that there was a mixed multitude that went up with them also, and flocks and herds and a great deal of livestock. You wonder the influence of that mixed multitude in their sin last week. You know, there's a purpose, and there's no other indication any place in Exodus why that little phrase was included in chapter 12. And I remember Kristen raised that point as we were reading through there about this mixed multitude. They weren't all Jews. They were coming from some other backgrounds. But in any case, perhaps they were part of what went on. Because one of the things I thought about is, well, how did they know that they should eat and drink after, quote, worship, and then rise up to play. What, this sounds like a common practice of pagan people. This sounds like something that the Jews would not have had as part of their lives. And in any case, they fell. They were led astray, and they fell. In 33.5, it said the people mourned for their sin. And now in verse 10, the people worship God when Moses went to meet with God. There's been a kind of a transformation here in these people, in their repentance, in their sorrow, as they f are forced to look at the reality of their sin. And God in his great mercy and grace has withheld his just wrath against all the people. There were plenty who died. We know there were 3,000 that the Levites killed, and we know there were others who were plagued. So in any case, there were many who died, but God could have brought his justice against the entire people. Let's read together um, verses 12 to 17. Uh, going into this next section, God of grace promises Moses. Then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. This is quite an interesting conversation, a discussion between God and Moses, bringing God an appeal, Moses bringing an appeal and acting as the mediator for the people. In verse 12, he says, you say to bring the people up, but who will you send with us? Who will go with us? 
And notice the emphasis on grace here. Five times in these verses 13 to 17, we see grace. Moses desires to ensure he is in God's will. He wants to ensure he does not step out, but he is walking where God wants him. In verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. We don't want to go. If you aren't going to go with us, we don't want you to go. Want to go. In verse 16, for how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight? Except you go with us. Mm -hmm. Think about when the spies went into the land and Caleb and Joshua came back and said, let's go. God's with us. And the others said, no, no. But then they changed their mind and they tried to go in in their own strength. And what happened? They were soundly defeated right away. Moses is crying out to God to go before them, to go with them, to direct them. Your people and I will be separate from all the people upon the face of the earth. Verse 16. This is more than a description of a physical way to travel, which they needed, of course. It's a lot deeper, though. Moses is asking God for the evidence of his grace to allow Moses to truly know him. For only in God's grace will Moses ever know God. Verse 13. And know the way in obedience service. Did you notice the tension also here between God and Moses as to whose people these are? And, and um, the Lord in 32.7 and 33.1 says that they are Moses' people, the people you brought up from Egypt. But in 33.13 and 16, Moses calls them the Lord's people. It's kind of like nobody really wants to claim them. But in the end, uh, it is only the grace of God that any of God's fallen, cursed creation can be accepted by him. Lord, you have found grace. Lord, the Lord said, you have found grace, verse 12, in my sight. Verse 14, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So we have moved from him saying, uh, in, in verse 3, uh, that he would not go with them in their midst, to in verse 14, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, it just, it, it just seems the significance of our appeals before God, crying out to God, coming before him, and he blessed Moses and the people. Verse 17, I will do this thing that you have spoken. So, God has moved from the time, the, the total break between them to going with them. Moses should feel pretty good at this point, I think, for the Lord is committed to being with the people and going to the land. Moses certainly has found grace with the Lord, but desires to truly know him more personally and intimately. That word know in verse 13 is the intimate no. It's the husband and wife knowing one another. It's the same word as Adam knowing Eve in Genesis chapter 4. It is a very personal knowledge of one another. Life is full of a series of victories in our walk with God. But then come tests, some of which we fail. This is that whole sanctification process. Our walk with Christ will never be straight up. It'll never be, we become a believer and we are taken out, as the pastor talks about. But it's this sawtooth process. It's this process of hopefully two, three steps forward before we have one step that we fall behind. But God is faithful. We have to keep reminding ourselves. Keep crying out for his grace, his wisdom and his strength in every single situation. So Moses has been blessed by God. Moses and the people will have God going with them. But Moses is still not satisfied. Look in verses 18 to 23. And he said, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness. The Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. 
I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. By the way, I'm reading from New King James, if you haven't figured that out. So Moses has spent a lot of time with God, and but now he asks God to show him his glory. Why would that be? Well, he's followed God's leading since God called him in the burning bush. He spent a lot of time with God. Here, Moses has made several requests of God, and God has agreed to them. And now Moses asks even for greater intimacy with God. And that greater understanding and intimacy with God will make his walk and leadership more dependent on God and lead him to be a better mediator. So Moses asked God, show me your glory. Is there something here to being bold in God's presence to ask God for his grace and his mercy? Moses is persistent in his interaction and appeal to God. It's kind of like that needy widow that we see in the Gospels. Jesus taught us some similar things there about persistence in prayer. In verse 19, God promises to reveal his goodness to Moses, for he will pass before him. And how will he describe himself? He will describe himself with his name. He will proclaim the name of the Lord, his goodness. The other essence of who he is encapsulates his glory, and his very person is revealed through his name. God will pass before Moses and bless him in honoring his request. But God will also shield Moses because Moses cannot be fully exposed to God's glory and goodness and still live. God will protect Moses. So God arranges to pass before Moses and hide Moses in that cleft of the rock. I love that hymn. And, not, and only allow Moses to see his glory and goodness as God moves away from him. God is not only showing his grace, graciousness, but also his mercy and his love for Moses. In Romans 9, Paul repeats the thought of God's grace and compassion in verse 15 and 16. In the context of election, uh, in the choosing of Jacob, and the rejection of Esau. For he says to Moses, I will have compassion. I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. God's grace and mercy, his compassion, are according to his will. It is not earned or deserved. The nation of Israel deserves God's justice were it not for his grace and compassion. His mercies are new every morning. In Lamentations, Jeremiah captured the same thought as we looked at this summer when we were studying Lamentations in chapter 3, verses 22 and 3. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We, we cannot grasp the, the, just the grace and the mercy of God, I think. And, and, but I think these chapters are useful to us to help us see some of what God is. So moving on to chapter 34, God's self-description. Um, these first nine verses, we see God providing according to his promise to Moses. In obedience, Moses prepares new tablets. He returns to the mountain early in the morning. 
And the most important thing for man is that he has the word of God. The people had broken their covenant with God. And now God is giving them a new copy of his law. Let's look at um, verses 5 through 7. Um, in, yeah, I'm going to read 5 through 7. I put 6 and 7 on the screen there for you. But Then the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So here's the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, that's Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So let's look at these words, the way God describes himself. He describes himself as Yahweh, the Lord God, the eternal God, the self-existent God, God himself. He is merciful, which means compassionate. He's full of compassion. And I was, I looked at Psalms for some of these attributes and, you know, they're just, the Psalms are replete with all these different attributes. For example, merciful, Psalm 78, 38, 86, 15, Psalm 111, verse four. They just, it's just, and there's many more. And, and gracious, he is gracious. Mercy and grace really kind of come together. They're, they're just naturally together. We see that in Psalm 103, verse eight. And again, Psalm 86, 15. He is long suffering. <laughs> Again, uh, you may have a little different wording depending on which translation you're using. Long suffering is really a special word. It's, it, you know, it shows his patience and his his slowness to anger. And again, we see Psalm 103 verse eight, Psalm 145 verse eight, and abounding in goodness, abounding in goodness, which means kindness, faithfulness. Psalm 63, 3, Psalm 85, 7. But the thing that struck me was, remember Genesis 1. Everything God created, he said it was good. His goodness was transferred to all of his creation. All of his creation was good by his design. It was perfect according to his purpose. And therefore, on the seventh day... He could sit back and enjoy the work that he had done. He's abounding in truth. He is continuous. There's a continuance, a reliability. Psalm 25, 5, Psalm 51, 6. There is mercy, mercy for thousands, like unlimited mercy. That goodness, that kindness, that faithfulness, that mercy shows up a hundred times in Psalms alone. He forgives iniquity, iniquity, that perversity, that depravity, that guilt. Psalm 51, two, five and nine. Psalm 90, verse eight, Psalm 103, verse three and verse 10. All these different places, this iniquity that we have in our lives, the transgression, the rebellion, he forgives rebellion. He forgives transgression. Psalm 25, 7 and 32, 1 and 7. And he forgives sin. Acting in opposition to God's authority. Again, rebellion. Psalm 51, 2 and 3. And Proverbs 5, 22. Visiting iniquity on the children. There's a reckoning. There's that appointing. That there are consequences of sin. And we know for all of us, there are consequences of sin. Sometimes we do see the sins of the fathers passed on to the children and the children's children. Sometimes we see God mercifully allowing the children not to take on our sins. But there are always consequences. 
there are always consequences to sin. There's always repercussions of sin. And therefore, the scriptures are clear of our need to repent and come before a holy God who will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So verse 8, Moses knew the overwhelming presence of God, and he worshiped God. He bowed his head to the earth, and he worshiped God. But then in verse 9, notice Moses makes one more request, actually three requests. He says, if now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are a stiff-necked people, pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us, take us as your inheritance. Take us as your possession. Even though we are a stiff-necked people, go among us. Pardon our sin. Pardon our iniquity. Take us as your own possession. In 34, 10 to 26, we see the covenant renewed. It's really very similar to what we covered in chapter 23. The covenant has been broken. The tablets were destroyed. If you know, the tablets being destroyed in a way was a sign of this covenant that was broken. Uh, and now God is renewing that covenant with the people and providing his new copy of the law. The text includes a description of the, the Sabbath, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first fruits and in gathering, the redemption of the firstborn. But also there's something here in verses 13 to 15 that I thought was interesting. God also added this important explanation regarding his command for the destruction of the inhabitants of the land and all that they stood for. This elimination of the pagan peoples would prevent a snare for Israel. And God also required no covenants be made with them, no covenants with any of these other peoples as well as destruction of all their places of idolatry, their altars, their pillars, their images, all of this idolatrous worship was to go. In Deuteronomy, a couple of uh, verses that, that um, uh, I picked up there, um, because God is a jealous God. There's to be no other worship, no other God. For our God is a jealous God. That is his name. Deuteronomy 4.14, the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. In Deuteronomy 5.9, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me visiting the iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. In verse 17, you shall make no molded gods for yourself, none. So God's people were to be just that, God's people. They were to be different from the pagan nations, to be able to teach the nations about the true God. God is jealous for his glory. That has not changed even in the day we live. He is the only true God. I was, um, I was struck. Um, I was struck by, you know, what is it about wanting to know what others are doing or have to do uh, when they, when you know the truth? So. You know, why is it that the church would entertain that which is not godly? Um, why does the world not come to want to know the truth, but contrives amazing alternatives? Uh, and, and I was just struck with um, Matthew 7, 13 to 15, that we are to walk on the narrow path. We are to seek that which is life. For everything else will lead to destruction. Do not be distracted by what anyone else offers. 
I was also thinking, and I don't know if we have enough time to talk about this, but I'll be really quick. Um, how ready are we to share the truth with other people? Uh, do we feel prepared to tell others about the true God, the eternal holy God? What do you say in encountering others? I'm sure every one of us has different ways of trying to approach a conversation. Pastor encourages us to share our own testimony. Um, it might be a little hard just to enter into a testimony with somebody. And there's a couple other questions that um, I was recently reading that I thought, I'll just throw that out here and, and uh, you can take it for what it's worth. But um, where are you planning to spend eternity? Uh, how are you going to get there? So something to confront someone. When and where were you born again? John 3.3 3 says you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. So when and where were you born again? Why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Are you relying on Christ alone? His perfect sacrifice provided our only access to God and freedom from condemnation, Romans 8.1. The world is focused on doing the work of Christ is done, 2 Corinthians 5.21. So going back to chapter 34 of Exodus, um, isn't it amazing this athlete, this 80-year-old Moses, is able to climb the mountains, climb that mountain several times. And then supernaturally go without food or water for 40 days and not be affected. I think we can clearly see God supernaturally provides and is always greater than our circumstances. For nothing is too difficult for him. So this last little paragraph about the shining face of Moses, I think it's actually pretty important. Um, starting at um, verse 29. Uh, let me just read down through here. Now, it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he walked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid and to come near to him. Then Moses called to them and Aaron, and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out and he would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had commanded, been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. <clears throat> so Moses returns this time from being with God and two things are different. The tablets are intact, and his face shines from being in the presence of God. Why did his face shine after only this encounter? Well, truly knowing God and knowing his glory impacted Moses' life. It impacts our lives. In Exodus 19, 16 to 17, the people were afraid of God when he came down to Mount Sinai with thunderings, lightnings, a thick cloud, the sound of a very loud trumpet, the people trembled. Now, even the glory of God on Moses' shining face made the people afraid to come near him. In verses 31 to 33, Moses called Aaron and the rulers of the people and gave them all the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. And then Moses put the veil on his face, apparently to allay their fear of him. In verses 34 and 5, when he went to the tabernacle of meeting, Moses took the veil off, but afterwards, after sharing with them again, Moses again covered his face. One commentator I was reading said Moses probably wore that veil for the next 40 years until he died. 
Paul picks up on this event in 2 Corinthians 3. In 3.7, Paul calls the Old Covenant the ministry of death engraved on stones. There was a certain glory there for it came from God, but the law cannot save. The law will only condemn. The law is something which fades in significance as Christ is revealed. In Hebrews 8, 7, it says, the law, if the law was faultless, there would be no need for a second covenant. But Jeremiah and Ezekiel both prophesied a better covenant, a new covenant. In Hebrews 8, 10, that new covenant is far better. For it is God's law written on our mind and on our heart. It is sins forgiven. He put a new spirit within his people. He promised to be their God, mm -hmm. and they shall be his people. In Hebrews 8, 13, in that he says, a new covenant, he made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So Paul, in 2 Corinthians 3, is teaching the significance of the completed work of Christ. The grace, the grace of God revealed to all men. 2 Corinthians 3, 13, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily mm -hmm. at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I always love verse 17. Now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well... I've done a lot of talking, and I'm sorry it's it's getting toward the end of our hour. But um, are there are there things that some of you would like to share regarding this passage? Um, and and uh, now I got one closing little comment. So uh, anybody, anybody like to make a comment about these two chapters? Uh, you know, things that you saw that I missed. <laughs> I, okay. I just have a comment about um, chapter 33, that whole section, verses 12 through 15, I think, where you're talking about how the word grace is repeated. Yeah. In there, mm -hmm. I think, five times. Uh, in the ESV, it's translated favor. Favor, really? Yeah, which I find helpful in, in understanding. Uh huh. If okay. I found favor in your sight. Sure. Okay, good. So favor in your sight. And does it come up that five times also, or is it just once yes. or twice? Yes, it does. All yeah. five times? Every time you had grace, it said favor. No kidding. Okay, interesting. You should have said unmerited favor, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Certainly grace is God's favor, no doubt about it. Okay. Well, then let me just share a couple of final thoughts. Um, Going back over here to this same PowerPoint, except that now I got to get back into it. Sorry. Um, so here's a couple final thoughts, just you know, kind of wrapping up this this couple chapters. The grace of God is written over all the pages of Exodus uh, and throughout the entire Word. So we love that overwhelming grace revealed in the completed work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the title of our lesson today is The God of Grace. Secondly, God graciously reveals his holy standards in Exodus, and no one can ever attain to them except by Christ alone, except Christ alone. It is not do this, but it is finished. It is done in Christ. And Jesus is the perfect law keeper and the perfect high priest and our only mediator before the holy God. And finally, our attitude can only be glory to God in thanksgiving and praise for our gracious God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ.
So final closing, 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there he is. <laughs> the <best. clears throat> let's, uh, let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for this uh, morning, the opportunity to um, open these two chapters, and uh, Lord, to just speedily work through them. We just thank you for your grace and your mercy and your loving care in each of our hearts and lives. And Father, we know that we fail. We sin. Thank you for forgiving our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Help us to walk closer to you each and every day. Help us to continue to seek to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And bless the 11 o'clock hour. Use your word in each of our hearts and lives uh, this day and every day. We pray and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. I'll stick around for a few minutes if somebody wants to uh, to visit a little more. Uh, thank you for bringing the word, Doug. Hey, you're welcome, Doug. <laughs>